Day 195 of the Trump administration, and while it's early yet in 11th hour terms, our two lead stories thus far tonight have to do with the new White House Chief of Staff, General John Kelly, U.S. Marine Corps retired, and the normalizing impact he is already apparently having in a West Wing that has functioned of late more like the Wild West. First tonight, a report from the Associated Press that says Kelly has reached out to a cabinet member who was recently publicly humiliated humiliated by the president uh, to tell him that he's safe. Jonathan Lemire broke the story. Jonathan standing by to talk to us. It goes like this, quote, Kelly in one of his first acts in his new post called Attorney General Jeff Sessions to reassure him that his position was safe despite the recent onslaught of criticism he has taken from President Donald Trump. The second report tonight is from Politico. It's about Kelly cracking down on the flow of information to the president, quoting here. Kelly has told aides that anyone briefing the president needs to show him the information first. The Trump West Wing tradition of aides dropping off articles on the president's desk and then waiting for him to react with a screaming phone call or a hastily scheduled staff meeting must stop. The non-Kelly news at the White House was made in the briefing room today. A new immigration plan widely considered to have no future in Congress that would cut by one half the number of people we allow in legally and would create a merit-based system of entry awarding points for things like age and job skill and ability to speak English. And in announcing this plan, a White House staffer became a bigger story than the plan itself. We're about to show you the senior your advisor to the president, Stephen Miller. This exchange begins after the New York Times' Glenn Thrush asked Miller for stats to back up this new approach. Well, I think it's very clear, Glenn, that you're not asking for common sense, but if I could just answer... If I could just answer your question, I named, I named, I named the studies, Glenn. Glenn, 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 I named the studies. I named the studies. I asked you for a statistic. Can you tell me how many, the Maybe we'll make a carve out in the bill that says the New York Times can hire all the low skilled, less paid workers they want from other countries and see how you feel then about low wage substitution. This is a reality that's happening in our country. I want to be serious, Jim. Do you really at CNN not know the difference between green card policy and illegal immigration? Sir, are you, I mean, are you my really don't know that. Cuban immigrant. He came to this country in 1962, uh, right before the Cuban Missile Crisis, and obtained a green card. But, but this Jim. whole this whole notion of well, they could learn, you know, they have to learn English before they get to the United States. Are we just going to bring in people from Great Britain and Australia? Jim, it's actually, I have to honestly say, I am shocked at your statement that you think that only people from Great Britain and Australia would know English. It's actually it reveals your cosmopolitan. Uh, bias to a shocking degree that in your mind, no, this is an amazing, this is an amazing moment. This is an amazing moment that you think only people from Great Britain or Australia would speak English is so insulting to millions of hardworking immigrants who do speak English from all over the world. That's about the way it went. If Mr. Miller looks familiar, this is his second overheated on-camera performance. His first was back in February, asserting his boss's unquestioned powers. Do you feel like you and your staff there that you're in control of events at the White House? I think to say that we're in control would be a substantial understatement. We have a president who has done more in three weeks than most presidents have done in an entire administration. I'm prepared to go on any show, anywhere, anytime, and repeat it and say the president of the United States is correct 100%. The end result of this, though, is that our opponents, the media, and the whole world will soon see as we begin to take further actions that the powers of the president to protect our country are very substantial and will not be questioned. More on Mr. Miller later and about Mr. Miller's boss. Let's switch to numbers. Donald Trump's approval rating hit a new low, according to new polling by Quinnipiac. It found 33% of Americans now approve of the job he's doing, 61% disapprove. On the upside first, 55% of Americans think Trump is intelligent, 57% think he's a strong person. But then there's this, as they say, 54% of respondents are embarrassed he's the president. 59% say he does not care about average Americans. 62% say he's not honest. 63% say he doesn't share their values. Another 63% say he does not have good leadership skills. And 71% say he is not level-headed. There's more. Seven in ten Americans say the president should stop tweeting. Most Americans believe the president 
has tried to either derail or obstruct the Russia investigation. Most Americans, but not most Republicans, believe Russia hacked our election. All of this is happening, let's not forget, against the very real world backdrop of North Korea. Testing intercontinental ballistic missiles and at the same time testing the patience of the U.S. and its neighbors. The situation could turn cataclysmic at any time. And next we want you to hear the president's national security advisor, General H.R. McMaster, in an interview he conducted with our own Hugh Hewitt. McMaster is talking about the possibility of a U.S. military confrontation with North Korea. We're going to play this as it aired on this network in the four o'clock hour this afternoon, including the reaction to it in real time in the moment by our 4 p.m. host, Nicole Wallace, who let's not forget was communications director in the Bush 43 White House. Look at the nature of that regime. If, it, if, if they have nuclear weapons that can threaten the United States, it's intolerable from the president's perspective. So, so of course, we have to provide all options to do that. And, and that includes a military option. Now, would we like to resolve it short of what would be a very costly war in terms of, in terms of the suffering of mainly the South Korean people, the, the ability of, of that North, North Korean regime to hold the South hostage to conventional fires capabilities, artillery and so forth, Seoul being so close. We're cognizant of all of that. And so what we have to do is, is everything we can to, to pressure this regime, to pressure Kim Jong-un and those around him, such that they conclude it is in their interest to denuclearize. Eli Stokels, I'm going to say something that, 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 that may be too provocative um, for sort of the times we're in, but the last time I heard a White House national security advisor talk about a gathering threat like that in public was when we were talking about the threat posed by Iraq when we thought they possessed weapons of mass destruction. That's shocking language from a sitting national security advisor. That was Nicole Wallace in this very studio in the 4 p.m. hour today. With that, let's bring in tonight's starting panel. White House reporter for the Associated Press, the aforementioned Jonathan Lemire, who broke that story tonight about the Attorney General. The aforementioned White House reporter for the Wall Street Journal and newly minted MSNBC contributor Eli Stokels. And White House correspondent for Bloomberg, Shannon Pettypiece, returns to our broadcast. Okay, Mr. Lemire, uh, since you gave us our lead story tonight, um, we endeavor around here to give high marks uh, when and where they're deserved. Last night's guests thought uh, the Secretary of State's statecraft on North Korea was uh, pitch perfect. Today, people are looking at this as a normalizing factor. This is what uh, White House Chief of Staff is supposed to do, make everything smooth out. In this case, reassuring a cabinet member that despite a public humiliation from the boss, he's going to be okay. That's right. We should start by taking a step back and recognize how unprecedented this was for a president to criticize a sitting member of his cabinet. There is that. Repeatedly, on a daily basis, he called him beleaguered. He called him weak. He suggested that if he could do it all over again, he wouldn't offer him the job because he recused himself from, from the Russia investigation. And that's all publicly. Privately, he told aides he mused about firing him. But over the weekend, we have learned, we've reported in the Associated Press tonight, uh, that the new chief of staff reached out to the attorney general suggested that while the president is still miffed about some of this, uh, still perhaps thinks that you were not as loyal as you should have been, mm. your job is safe, that we're not looking for you to resign, the president is not looking to fire you. Also, within the White House, there is a growing recognition that the attacks on the attorney general were politically risky. Jeff Sessions is still very popular among the conservative base that helped elect this president. We saw last week a number of senators rush to his defense. A number of influential members of the conservative media rushed to his defense. And he's been an activist cabinet member. That's exactly right. There are people who believe that he is, in fact, perhaps been the cabinet member who's been most successful in terms of delivering on Trump campaign promises. So this is General Kelly taking a step to try to take the temperature down, to try to say, look, we're going to try to move beyond this and get back to work. Now, to Eli Stokels, who we note has cosmopolitan tendencies. Let's be fair. Thank you, Brian. <laughs> about Mr. Miller and about uh, the new chief of staff, Kelly. Um, how is Kelly likely to view that appearance 
in the briefing room today as opposed to how the boss is likely to view that appearance. Yeah, I think that's the question. I mean, I think what he was doing out there was sort of mollifying that base, the Breitbart reader who looks at this and sees the attacks on Sessions and says, wait a second, what are you doing? We like that guy. I mean, here they are again sort of out in the open playing the white identity politics card as they did so often throughout the campaign. It's probably a win for their base. Uh, the president probably likes the combativeness when he sits back there and sees, you know, Stephen Miller going at members of the, the press, the mainstream media. He probably likes that, but, but you can see from what the new chief of staff is trying to do, John Kelly's reaching out to Democratic leaders, he's trying to sort of pacify situations, cool tensions, and he's trying to figure out how to stabilize this administration. And he recognizes that you've got to do more if you're going to be successful than just please your own base, than just rile up your base and harden divisions. And I don't think Stephen Miller did that. I think he... He continued to sort of, you know, inflame passions, uh, excite the president, excite the base, and, and they got to get beyond just doing that if they're going to be successful in the administration. I think, you know, trying to sort of ease tensions is smart, but I think anybody who's sitting there and trying to, and saying, okay, everything's fixed, new sheriffs in town, I mean, Donald Trump is who Donald Trump is, right? And just because Kelly says something to Sessions doesn't mean that Donald Trump won't get agitated and lash out again. Just because Mike Pence is going around Europe reassuring allies that we stand with them and we're going to help Looking like defend them against Russia, yeah. I don't know how anybody can really take that completely seriously because everybody knows that you have a very volatile uh, commander-in-chief in that Oval Office and nobody knows what he's going to do and Mike Pence can say whatever he wants in Europe and John Kelly can say and, and act and do things that a normal chief of staff would do to sort of stabilize that West Wing but again this all comes down to Donald Trump and his ability to sort of rein in those impulses. So Shannon then we have the matter of our, of our lead stories there preceding you of these numbers these poll numbers. Uh, you'll note as you have noted that um, Donald Trump doesn't talk about the polls anymore. They were a staple of his rally speeches during the campaign. The question to you is do you think these numbers are are baked into the cake to mix my metaphors that he is going to be underwater um, but this is about damage control and moving forward and trying to cobble together some semblance of an agenda and of course poll numbers don't really necessarily matter at this point because the election is you know about a year or sorry, three and a half years away so I mean you can make the case you know what does these polling numbers matter right now but they do matter to someone whose election is not three and a half years away and that's members of Congress particularly the number of Republicans in the Senate who are up for re-election in 2018 and every member in the House who is up for re-election to 2018 so while the Trump administration may be able to say oh we'll do a base play uh, who cares about polls at this point they desperately need to get Congress on their side and at this point the Congress is almost in mutiny uh, I mean the Senate won't come talk to them uh, you know they want the Senate to talk about health care McConnell saying uh, no moving on uh, they unanimously supported this Russia sanctions bill that the White House lobbied against so they don't have a Congress on their side and they forget they're one of multiple branches of government here they need a Congress to get through this legislative agenda so when I I see these poll numbers. I know that every member of the House and those members of the Senate who are up for re-election are seeing these two, and they have to make a very quick calculation. Do I distance myself? How far at this point? I mean, not do I distance myself from the president, but how far do I distance myself from them when my re-election's coming around um, in really about a year from now? Jonathan, all of this is so new. All the behavior we're seeing from the podium and looking at the podium, uh, Jim Acosta uh, over at CNN, I'm not sure people could hear the point he was making. He is the son uh, of a man who came here not speaking a word of English, uh, pr just pre cast uh, Cuba. He feels this issue uh, innately. Do you think the appearance of Mr. Miller before the usual daily briefing was intended to be a kind of shiny object distraction given the fact that no one gives this immigration measure any future at all on the Hill? It seems that way. This is another, yet another pivot to the base by this administration. There's enough opposition to this bill in the Senate. This seems has like has very little chance of actually passing. Uh, they put Stephen Miller up there today. He calls it 
historic legislation, the most important thing any president has done on immigration in decades, even though he recognizes this is probably DOA when it goes to the, when it goes to the Senate. He even lectures Jim Acosta as to when the famous poem on the Statue of Liberty was actually inscribed, yeah. the, the huddled masses, that he makes a point of saying, hey, that wasn't there initially. That was added later. I think this is about, this is about politics. This is about the president trying to score points with his base, and not just on immigration, which is an issue that he has yet to actually do much on to this point in his term, but also continuing his fight with the media. Who are the two reporters that Stephen Miller picked fights with today that he had verbal clashes with? The New York Times and CNN. This is, again, who the president wants to hit. He'd much prefer to be having that conversation than some of the others about policy. We also looked at a world atlas and found no sign of Great Britain, but uh, more on that later. Uh, Eli, are you surprised at McMaster? Uh, this interview he's given Hugh Hewitt is uh, really watchable and very interesting. It'll air this weekend. Um, he has been rumored to be on the outs now and again. Yeah, he's been frustrated, and I think there's a lot of tensions internally over what to do with the Afghanistan policy, uh, not to mention North Korea looking at a menu of options, none of which look very palatable. And so it's very difficult. It's very serious. There's a lot of tension within the NSC. Uh, there's been some folks on the NSC who were there as sort of Flynn disciples who uh, McMaster has just this week uh, started to clean out. Um, but you never really know if he's going to actually get firm control right. of the NSC or whether or not there are going to be people in there who sort of continue to keep uh, the NSC gridlocked over what to do on these serious things. I think you can hear in that interview the gravity of the situation with North Korea. Uh, we've yet to hear really the president and other people in the administration speak with the same that level of gravity yeah. about that threat. Shannon, when you're Donald Trump and you uh, need to feel the love, you go back to the base, which for him tomorrow uh, means a second trip in rapid succession to West Virginia, which means for us, 24 hours from now, we will likely be talking about what he had to say to a lathered up crowd in the base tomorrow night. The people around the president know if you want to get him back on his footing, get him to a rally. Uh, he loves doing these rallies. He is good in these rallies. He's in his comfort zone. It gets him feeling more confident. And they have wanted to do more of these, and I think they're going to continue doing more of these. Now, uh, to my point about 2018 as well, too, getting into next year, and I know that seems like a ways off, but getting into next year, 2018, too, I think we'll see him doing more of these rallies as well, out for those members in the districts that are popular we can help with and you know other members saying hey no don't come to my neighborhood to do a rally you know it's not going to be doing a rally in the suburbs of Philadelphia probably for any members up for re-election but uh, yeah it'll be an interesting the past few rallies have been quite interesting the boy Scout, I guess interesting is a word I keep repeating but the Boy Scouts one was interesting in Youngstown he was certainly fired up there so uh, we'll be watching tomorrow night and we should be specific while in West Virginia it will be a non Boy Scout uh, crowd yeah. Our our great thanks to our first panel tonight, Jonathan Lemire, Eli Stokels, Shannon Petty Peace. Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.